Oh, hey, are you writing another screenplay? Mm. Oh, cool, can I read it? Mm. All right. Let's see. Mm. Fade in. Um, that's it. Mm. Oh, well, have I got the tips for you. Hello filmmakers, Ash here, and welcome to Film It Yourself. Whether you're writing a short film, a feature film, or even outlining a documentary, learning the three-act story structure can help you understand how to make your story hit all the right beats that viewers love to see on screen. You might also have heard of it referred to as the hero's journey, Joseph Campbell's personal way to break the three-act story structure into beats focused on the main hero or protagonist. Or you might have heard Sid Field's version in his book, Screenplay, The Foundations of Screenwriting. While different people might have different terms, the basic parts are all generally still the same. It just comes down to whose semantics you prefer. Now, just note here that the three-act story structure isn't the end-all be-all of story structure. For example, there's also a five-act story structure that is more commonly used in plays or TV. However, the three-act story structure has become the screenplay template for most screenwriters, and audiences have come to expect it. That being said, you can always break the rules once you know them. Also, it's not possible to get into all the details of a three-act story structure in just one video, so I'll just be covering the basic elements here. I highly encourage you to purchase a screenwriting book like Sid Fields to get more in-depth info on the subject. To see which screenwriting books I recommend, check out my video here. Now, let's get into how to write a three-act structure for a film. The three-act structure is probably so popular because every story has a beginning, middle, and end. By breaking it up this way, the three-act structure creates logical breaking points by dividing your story into Act 1, Act 2, and Act 3. So, let's start with Act 1. Act 1 is where you'll want to introduce your main character, also known as the protagonist. You'll also want to define what their normal world and daily life look like, as well as set up any important elements that might come into play later on. It's also where that all-important inciting incident will fall. Act 1 typically is about 1 to 30 pages, and looks something like this. It starts off with your character's ordinary world, as Campbell would call it. This is your character's normal, everyday life. Let's use one of my favorite films as an example, Jurassic Park. Dr. Alan Grant is our protagonist, and his ordinary world is working as a paleontologist digging up dinosaur bones in the desert. Establishing your protagonist's ordinary world is important because we want Act 2 to be in contrast with it. A lot of times, Act 2 even propels your character into a new world or location that's very different and foreign to them. But as viewers, we can only know how foreign it is by seeing their ordinary world first. So, for example, Dr. Grant's ordinary world is digging up dinosaur bones in the desert, but in Act 2, we find him on a lush, tropical island being chased by living, breathing dinosaurs. See how this is the exact opposite of his ordinary world? Act 1 is also your chance to introduce us to the protagonist. Show us their hopes and dreams, who they are as a person, their flaws, and maybe even hints at what they emotionally really need to be fulfilled. This is something they will learn during their journey throughout the film so that they can grow and change. In Jurassic Park, in the very first scene we meet Dr. Grant, we learn he isn't very good with children when he scares a young boy with a raptor claw as he details how they hunt. His partner, Dr. Ellie Sattler, even asks him point blank, what's so wrong with kids? To which Dr. Grant has a long list of reasons why children suck. What a grouch. So, we can tell right away that he could stand to learn some empathy and patience for children. Next, we have the inciting incident, as Field would call it, or the call to action, as Campbell would call it. This is some key event that disrupts your protagonist's normal everyday life and starts them down the path of the story. So, for example, in Jurassic Park, the inciting incident happens when John Hammond invites Dr. Grant to tour his mysterious amusement park. 
Note that the inciting incident usually comes at about page 15 or 15 minutes into the film. For a fun exercise, the next time you watch a movie, pause it when the inciting incident happens and note the time code. You know, if you want to be an insufferable person to watch movies with, like me. The reason the inciting incident happens so soon is because you don't want to spend too much time in your character's ordinary world, or else the viewers might get bored. After all, there's no obstacles or objectives for the protagonist yet, and these are really what drive drama in your story. Next is what Campbell calls the refusal of the call, or what is also known as second thoughts or debate. As these names might suggest, this is the moment after the inciting incident where your protagonist basically refuses the call to adventure that they've been presented with. It's usually followed by something that convinces your protagonist to then accept the call. But why would your protagonist refuse the call to adventure? Well, usually because they are pretty stuck in their ways and are comfortable in their ordinary world. But as we as viewers know, they need this adventure so they can grow. If your protagonist isn't necessarily a character that's stuck in their ways, this can be a part of your script where you question if they're even really up to the task the inciting incident presents them with. After all, this is most likely a big life decision they're making, and we as humans usually spend some time thinking about big life decisions before just jumping in. This is a chance to have your protagonist weigh all their options and have them make a firm decision to accept the call to action after some debate. Ultimately, you want your protagonist to be active and make choices that drive the film. You don't want them to be passive and just have things happen to them. In Jurassic Park, Dr. Grant quickly rejects Hammond's offer, claiming he has too much work at the dig site, but Hammond eventually convinces him by offering to fund his work for the next three years. However, Dr. Grant still brings a lot of skepticism with him to the park, where Hammond spends the next 15 minutes trying to convince him and everyone else that the park is a good idea. This section of the film sets up important elements and introduces us to new characters that will all become important when we cross into Act 2. We learn that Hammond needs to convince investors that the park is safe. We meet Ian Malcolm, who is highly skeptical of the park and seems to threaten Dr. Grant's relationship with Dr. Sattler. We also learn that Hammond has succeeded in actually reproducing dinosaurs, including raptors, and that they could possibly be dangerous. Right before Act 2, we have one final beat, and that's what Field calls Plot Point 1, or what Blake Snyder, the author of the screenwriting book Save the Cat, calls Breaking into Two. This is a crucial moment for your protagonist because it's the moment that they make the conscious decision to accept the call to action. It's the story giving them a push to take steps towards the adventure. In Jurassic Park, this moment comes to a head when the characters are literally sitting around a table debating whether or not the park is a good idea. Still skeptical, but tempted by the idea of seeing more alive dinosaurs, Dr. Grant and the others embark on their tour of the park. Here, we also meet Hammond's grandchildren, who, to Dr. Grant's dismay, will be joining them. Remember how Dr. Grant needs to learn empathy for children? Well, now the story is literally forcing him to spend time with them, though he continues to try to quite literally shut them out. Next, we finally have Act 2. In the hero's journey, this is called crossing the threshold, because often the protagonist is literally stepping through a threshold into a new and foreign world. In the case of Jurassic Park, Dr. Grant is literally driving through gates in order to enter the park. Act 2 is about creating obstacles and twists for your protagonist on their journey. It's what Snyder likes to call fun and games, because this is basically the core of the fun adventure your film has promised. It's where all the antics of the film's premise finally come into play, and usually what the viewers will get a taste of in the film's trailer. This is what they paid to see. Field calls Act 2 the confrontation, because it's really where your character is confronting one challenge after another. It usually stretches from around page 30 to page 90 of your screenplay, which makes it the biggest of the three acts, as it really is the meat of the story. The basic structure of Act 2 is obstacle sandwiching a midpoint that all continue to rise the stakes for your protagonist. Obstacles are pretty straightforward. They're just things that get in your protagonist's way. For example, 
In Jurassic Park, there's a tropical storm on its way, threatening to cancel the tour, and the dinosaurs are nowhere to be seen. Ian continues to flirt with Dr. Sattler, and then after a slight detour, she decides to separate from the group when she gets nasty with a sick Triceratops' poop. Gross. Also, Dennis Nedry, a disgruntled park employee, is up to no good. This then leads to the midpoint, which is usually a twist of some kind. This can be a reversal of fortune for your protagonist. So, if everything's been going smoothly, this is the moment where something goes bad. Or, if everything has been going bad, this is the moment of success for the protagonist. In the case of Jurassic Park, this is where Nedry shuts down the security system to steal the embryos, which then sets the dinosaurs loose, specifically the T-Rex. Suddenly, Dr. Grant and everyone else on the tour with him are no longer safe. The T-Rex eats the lawyer, attacks Ian, and forces the kids and Dr. Grant into the park. Note once again the children theme here. Dr. Grant, a guy who hates children, is now put in a position where he must save their lives. The midpoint usually falls somewhere around page 45 to 60, depending on how long your screenplay is. This is then followed by some more obstacles, and usually these obstacles raise the stakes even higher than the ones before the midpoint did. For Dr. Grant, that means that he and the two kids are now lost in the park without a car and must find ways to survive dinosaur attacks. Hammond and Ray Arnold, a park employee, decide to turn off the power to reset the system, but struggle to get the power back on, so Ray goes to do it manually. When Ray doesn't return, Dr. Sattler and Robert Muldoon, the park's fill-in John Wayne, set out to investigate and discover those pesky raptors that were set up in Act 1 are loose. And finally, good old Nedry gets acid dino spit to the face. Ah, he did have it coming though. Next is what Snyder calls the all is lost moment, but it's also been called the big gloom. Like the name suggests, this is a moment of extreme defeat for the character. It's where it seems like, well, all is lost. In romantic comedies, this is where the lovers break up. In action films, this is where the hero has been beaten or captured by the bad guys. Or it could be where the hero's mentor is suddenly killed, like in Star Wars when Vader kills Obi-Wan Kenobi, or Speed when Howard Payne blows up a house with Harry Temple inside. Back in the dino park, things seem to be going well when Dr. Sattler turns the power back on manually. But this action electrocutes Timmy, sending him flying from the electric fence. Dr. Grant must now resuscitate him and literally save a child's life. On the other side of the park, Dr. Sattler discovers the raptors killed Ray and Robert and narrowly escaped death herself. Next is what Snyder calls the Dark Knight of the Soul, and what Campbell calls Approach to the Innermost Cave. This is basically a beat where the hero emotionally deals with the ramifications of the physical loss that happened in the All is Lost beat. It's a huge moment of doubt for the character. All their hard work has been for nothing, and it seems as if they will never achieve their goals. Basically, they're feeling pretty sorry for themselves right about now. It can be a brief moment that comes quickly on the heels of the all is lost beat, but the protagonist usually needs a revelation of some sort to push them to keep going forward into act three. This can either be a realization that what they emotionally needed fulfilled trumps whatever physical need they were after this whole time. Or it can be a pep talk from a close friend or loved one that convinces them not to give up. Back with Dr. Grant, he struggles to revive Tim, who isn't breathing. We see real fear and concern from Dr. Grant, and Tim's revival pushes him to carry on. And finally, to close out Act 2, we have what Field calls Plot Point 2, or what Snyder calls Breaking into 3, and it usually falls at around page 85. This is the moment your protagonist comes up with their big idea to defeat the bad guy. It's also a moment where the hero realizes how to accomplish their physical need and their emotional needs at the same time. If the midpoint twist was bad for the hero, then this story beat has a false sense of success. So, for example, in Jurassic Park, Dr. Grant arrives at the visitor center with the kids and has a touching moment with Tim before going off to gather the others. He is then reunited with Dr. Sattler, and for the moment, it seems everyone he cares about is safe. 
which now takes us to Act 3, which typically falls between page 90 and 120, but can be as short as only 15 pages. Field calls this act the resolution because it's where we wrap everything up that has been set up or built on throughout the film. This is where we finally get what we've all been waiting for, the climax. The climax is the main big showdown between your protagonist and the bad guys. It's usually the most dramatic set piece in the film and can be full of action. In Jurassic Park, it's where the raptors break into the visitor center and chase the kids, Dr. Grant and Dr. Sattler. There can sometimes also be a twist in the climax to keep things interesting. Back at the visitor center, we get one of the most dramatic and memorable twists in cinema history. The T-Rex from Act 2 shows up and saves the day, proving once again that life finds a way. The rest of Act 3 is called The Resolution and typically falls around page 110. It's important to keep this section brief because once again, there's no more objectives or obstacles for the protagonist. This is really just where we wrap up any loose ends with the story, see how the characters emotionally deal with the results of the climax, and understand how they and other characters around them have changed. Typically, this is a happy moment, but in tragedies, it can be a sad moment. For Jurassic Park, all the living survivors are reunited and escape the island on a helicopter, where Dr. Grant falls asleep snuggling the kids. Snyder calls this section the final image and notes how it's a complete reversal of how we first met the protagonist. Remember when we first met Dr. Grant, he was threatening to slice open a child's belly with a raptor claw? Just look at him now. Oh, I think his heart grew two sizes bigger. So there you have it. Basic screenplay, three act structure. If you want to learn more about screenwriting, check out my playlist here or check the link for these books in the description below. Also, let me know in the comments if there's any story beats you think that I missed and what your favorite film climax scene is. And if you're hoping to actually shoot your screenplay and need some filmmaking templates, you can get access to all of my templates and more by supporting me on Patreon for the low cost of just $5 a month. There, I have other tiers that get you early access to my videos, as well as my entire filmmaking chat live stream archive, where I interview other filmmakers so you can learn from their sage wisdom. There's over 25 recordings exclusively on Patreon, so there's lots more to learn there. So until next time, watch out for dinosaurs and go film it yourself.